So we have Chris Saxon, developer advocate, SQL magician, SQL extraordinaire, one of our best presenters in the world. Um, if you're in Europe or the UK, it's really easy to find him. And no, actually, no matter where you are on the internet, it's easy to find him. He regularly takes your questions at asktom.com. Uh, I'm waiting for him to legally change his name to Tom, but he's not quite that. <laughs> I'll yet. Change, my, change my middle name, right? That's a compromise. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Tom Saxon. And uh, helping him today, or not even helping him today, uh, adding his years of real world wisdom and experience is Kimberg Hansen, recent author of Practical Oracle SQL. I bought this with my own money. That's how much I respect and believe in Kim's expertise. Oh <laughs> um, so our, our uh, overriding theme today is the converged database. And this topic right now is what makes all of that possible. So regardless of the type or nature of the data you're storing, SQL is your silver bullet. I don't believe in silver bullets, but in this case, I make an exception. SQL is the silver bullet. And with that, I turn it over to Chris and Kim. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for the Thank great you. introduction. All right, then. We've, we've had our introduction, so we don't need to see this. Um, so we are having a party. Um, so what do we need to have a party? We need some fireworks, right? Um, so well, unfortunately, none of <laughs> unfortunately, we're not able to go out and go to the shops anymore. But um, it, one of the worst things you could do if you last minute shopping for a party, go somewhere and find they're completely out of stock. So let's imagine we're actually the retailer, you want to make sure that based on your predictions on how much you're going to sell, you know, when are we going to re run out? When do we need to restock? Um, so this is a real problem you act actually have to solve whether it's getting on for what 20 years ago now, I think, Kim, was it? <laughs> Well, uh, yes, it's a comp the company I used to work at before, and I worked there 16 years. And at some point, we started to sell fireworks. In Denmark, fireworks at New Year is big thing. I mean, it's like, uh, well, maybe not billions, but at least many, many millions of money that everybody is just shooting up onto, into thin air. Um, but they want it. And there's a lot of restrictions when we sell fireworks. We have to count net explosive mass, NEM. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we are only allowed in each store where we're selling it from to have a certain amount. Then we need to restock. Problem is, if we restock too soon and it's still half full, the store, then it's kind of a waste of a drive out yeah. to that store to restock. If we restock too late, customers will come and there's no fireworks. <laughs> so we have to find when will they, the store reach zero net explosive mass. Okay. So and the that's yeah. the example here. Yeah. Okay. So we've got kind of something like this where you've got your actual sales coming in hour by hour. And then yep. we imagine this We've got our red bars up to now, and then the yellow is what we're predicting we think we're going to sell in the future. And so we need to kind of graph, essentially build this in SQL and look at this big green line at the top and watch when that go drops down to zero. That's, that's the essence of what you're trying to do here, isn't it? Exactly. Yes. So, so you were brought in. Um, so, I understand you had a, a, a SQL solution. Uh, well, before SQL, you had some uh, some non-SQL solution. And tell us a little bit about that. We <laughs> did have a, a, sol a solution. Um, we had a legacy uh, procedural language called XAL, and things were do done in that. It did some more than just this, but still, it was a slow process. Okay. Um, it was like you show here, it was a process that looped over each of the shops, then looped over the hours and did a lot of complex things inside. For five stores, we were at the beginning. Well, it took two hours. That was kind of okay. It was a daily uh, process, but the we grew and now the company has 80 stores, 80 times two hours, and that has to be done daily. 
not scalable. <laughs> it doesn't fit, does it? Doesn't, it doesn't it, fit. <laughs> not into 24 hours. Okay. So uh, we turned it into a single SQL statement with analytic functions, partitioned by store, and that way um, made it all possible to scale up and do the entire calculation in minutes instead of like uh, <laughs> instead of two and a half day. Oh yeah, half a week basically. Yeah. So okay. So yep. you so you had to start off running building a running total, calculating the running sum. I guess some, something a bit like this. Exactly. Yes. And the running total is one of the very, very nice things that analytic functions can do. I mean, analytic functions can do a lot. And if you read about analytic functions, there are like tons of analytic functions, very advanced ones and very simple ones. And you can do very tricky things with the window clause. But I have used analytic functions since 2001. <laughs> and uh, I have found that I use it, well, maybe not daily, but almost daily. Mm -hmm. And it's 90% of the cases, at least, it's relatively simple analytic functions like this. A rolling sum, it's not rocket science, but it really makes a huge difference in how efficient your SQL can be and what you can solve in SQL. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's kind of obvious we can use this to calculate the running total of how much we sold so far. I think there's a slight leap to then kind of say, well, you can use this to subtract it from the stock you've got to, you know, predict where your stock levels will be. So you can do something a bit like this. So you had your starting um, amount, and but you've got a slightly different windowing clause here, I notice, as well, isn't it? We're not just yeah. doing... Current rate. Can you talk a bit more about why we need that, to do this? Ex that's a, a very nice point because many will read about the rolling sum, and that was like the preceding slide where you, we include the Q and row. So it's rolling sum up to and including Q and row. But this one is the rolling sum of all preceding rows. Right. And the trick there is then to say, okay, if I have my starting name, start net explosive math, that's what's in the stock, and then the start calculate. So all of the quantity from, from the hours preceding Q and hour, if I take the rolling sum of all that and subtract from the starting, then that means that this is now the expected NEM in stock at the beginning of this hour. Right. Yeah. Not at the end, but at the beginning of this hour. Right. When I do that tr little trick with uh, between unbounded preceding and one preceding. So that is actually uh, something we are going to see that later that has helped me in, in quite a few situations. That little thing about using the window clause to kind of uh, go into fire discovering exactly which rows are it that you want to sum together. Right. Okay, so I think that's, that's the key point you said there. You want to know, to find the hour when we're going to run out, you need the stock at the start of the hour, not at the end of the hour, because then we can we can filter on this um, where find everything where the stock is above zero. So we can do something a bit like this: say where the stock is above zero, then um, we know there's still stuff to le left to sell in that hour. And then once it's below zero, we've we run out, right? Isn't it? But you exactly. we, can, we can find yeah. the greatest, the maximum date with that stock greater than zero. But you, you feel like you're doing some other cool stuff here as well in this, aren't you? So let's, we can you talk us a bit more about what's yeah. going on here. In this one, the stock name greater than zero. So that's those hours where we still have stock. 
So the max hour there is then that hour during that hour, we will go below zero because the next hour had a stock name below zero. So it's uh, not included by our where clause. So uh, what I would like to do here is try and calculate, okay, is it what, what minutes within that hour will it happen? <laughs> If I estimate that there will be a linear, uh, that the sales will be linear throughout the hour. Right. And that's then where I want to know what was exactly that stock name in that hour where I'm going to go down. And uh, I cannot just use max stock name immediately because that would get me the stock name from that hour where I had the most. Right. From Not from that hour that was the last one. But with yeah. the keep clause, the keep clause, um, yeah, they, you find the documentation about this in analytic functions, but for me, it's kind of like an extension of an aggregate function instead. Mm -hmm because we are using it together with aggregate in this case. Yeah, and with the dense rank last order by hour, simply says that, okay, um, those rows that are the last when we order by hour, there may be more than one, in this case, in this case there is only one. Only those rows should you apply the max clause to and therefore, I get the stock name exactly of that last hour. Right. So when I take that and I do the similar with the max of quantity name, which is the expected to be sold during that hour and divide them up, I get a ratio of, I will re be able to reach 0 0.7 of an hour. And then I put num to ds interval and Give that uh, result then gives me at what minute will I reach zero? We, we can find the exact second when when we're predicted to run out of stock. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think it's nice. So I think it looks it looks a bit weird this keep thing at first, um, but if, I think the key point is you've got the row for the maximum hour or the maximum date, and you want to get values from other columns for that particular row, isn't it? And then yeah, this is, it's, know, uh, it's a m bit of mix of analytic and aggregate in that the dense rank last, mm. that's kind of analytic. So you apply that to give the, your rows a dense rank. And then the last one, the, the, those rows that have the highest dense rank by that order, Mm. Uh, only those rows you apply the aggregate to. Since I know here that I only have one, I could have used min, I could have used max, but if in case there were more, then you do need to pick an aggregate function. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, it's interesting you mentioned about the docs as well. You say they should be aggregates, aggregates but actually I think this is one of those functions that trying to find it in the docs can be quite tricky because it's not listed under keep or, nope. you know. It's it listed under the first and <laughs> last. Exactly, which appears like right in the middle of the statement there, <laughs> you know, yeah. get it. So it's... Um, um, it, the documentation for this is not logically placed in my opinion, <laughs> but uh, that's a different discussion. Definitely. Well, we could we complain about the docs another day. Um, okay, so this is, I mean, the basic engine of this is pretty straightforward. We we had that calculate the rolling sum, excluding today, and we did this this little bit of jiggery pokery at the end here to actually calculate the exact hour. So you you got the full statements, which uh, it looks a little bit scary to start with, but actually the stuff on the left here is pretty much just setting up doing your joins really here isn't it and it's the stuff on the right yes. it's the real engine exactly the left part is that i have the this data in various tables so i join them up and set up the source that i'm calculating on left side that's 
basically it the entire calculate zero hour uh, calculate zero second actually um, mm -hmm. and everything partitioned by the shop so I don't even need to loop over shops the SQL <laughs> does that for me yeah um, and the key thing for me is that okay um, it's maybe a little bit more than your typical uh, imp and dept Scott examples, mm -hmm. but it's not that much. And it's not really highly complicated stuff. Exactly. But stuff like, like this, that sort of call it intermediate level SQL, um, this is this is going to save your save your butt uh, ninety eight <laughs> percent of times when you are solving uh, solving problems. Yeah. Well, you see, so you mentioned the previous um, procedural solution was projected to take several days. How long did the SQL solution take to to run the SQL statement? To run the SQL statement, I think we were down to. <laughs> 70, 80 seconds or something like that. So, so, so just over a minute, basically. Yeah, um, <laughs> something like that. Clear, clear and, winner, that that's, right? <laughs> and basically the cause of that was more those join things on the left. The, the SQL you're showing here is just a little bit simplified. There were some stupid mm. stuff in the data model. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> but even so, that minute, uh, approximate a minute, that was very acceptable. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, to, well, to, you know, several days is just unworkable. You know, I think most people live with a minute that, you know, this is probably some background job, I imagine, that, you know, exactly. spit, spit it out. Very nice. Um, and I think it's interesting as well, if people go, oh, prediction, I might need to use something like machine learning to do this. And... It's true, maybe as the business got really, really sophisticated, maybe they would want to do that, in which case you could just swap this out. But actually, you don't need to do it. You can just start with, sim with SQL. A lot of the times that's going to be good enough, and then you can evolve to a better solution yeah. if you need to. I mean, for prediction and forecasting, what we do here is like the most extremely simple model that we use to predict with. It's mm -hmm. basically, it, it's not even worthy of the name prediction model. <laughs> um, but then you can go a bit further and go to some time series models and so on. And then you are into something that data scientists would understand. Mm -hmm. But even that you can develop in one SQL statement still. Then you can use some of the more advanced analytic functions, the uh, regression uh, functions, regression slope, regression, whatever. There are uh, different functions of those. You can still do a lot just with what's standard SQL uh, in, mm -hmm. within the database. And then as we see here with the converged database thing, then when you're even want to go to machine learning and even want to add real uh, predictive data modeling, mm -hmm. uh, you can still utilize that using SQL. When you've set it up, you can still query those predictive models using SQL. So SQL is the basis of everything. You can solve <laughs> everything in SQL. Solve every, as Jess was saying, it's, uh, it's, it's the solution. All right, so we've, we've got our fireworks. The shops are all stocked up with that. The next thing we need to worry about is getting the drinks in, right? Yep. Um, Otherwise, and... Jeff will leave the party. <laughs> exactly. Well, everyone will leave the party if there's no drinks, right? <laughs> I think. Um, and again, we'll, we'll be the retailer here. Um, uh, instead of making predicting we've got enough stock, we need to find out which stock we've got to take, right? So you've got some kind of warehouse um, that looks a little bit like this. So we've got various yep. locations. So you, again, this was another thing that you were asked to do. You had to find how to, which locations to choose the stock from, right? 
Yeah, uh, the problem is when you have products that have a shelf life, mm -hmm. you would like to operate first in, first out. So that when you go around picking in the warehouse, you need to pick the oldest stock that you have. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait a so second, that, guys. Yeah. One of those, one, I recognize those bottles. <laughs> one, one, was, one, one looked like a Heineken bottle. That doesn't have a shelf life, does it? It just lasts like, um, forever. <laughs> uh, I didn't pick those pictures. Sorry. If it was a Heineken, then it doesn't fit because that's not beer. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then. So but we, we had the warehouse, so we have an order we need to pick for. Yep. And we need to select in first in, first out. And then when we have selected them, we need to put those locations in some good order to drive around the warehouse and do the picking. Okay. And that's like kind of two order buys. And most people would say, you need to do this procedurally. First, you query the uh, products and find the locations of the oldest and you put that into an array and then you sort it and then you uh, output that array. Mm -hmm. Most people would like to do that, but again, SQL can solve it. Okay, so we'll start with the first bit, the first in, first out picking and choosing, yeah. figuring out which to choose. So this this is actually remarkably similar to what you were, we were doing just a few slides ago. We've we've got a sum a, a sum with a partition and order by and rows between unbounded proceeding and one proceeding. It, it's almost exactly the same, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. And you see the the problem with if I use rows between unbounded preceding and current row, mm. then yes, I get that row, the last row that. Uh, I, I get that row where I have enough. Mm -hmm. I have picked enough, but I cannot very easily um, in my where clause stop at that row and then no further. Yeah, I get you. But if I do it the, this way instead, that my rolling sum is all of the preceding rows. That means that my where clause can now be, okay, if the sum of all the previous rows is less than the quantity I need, then I'm not done yet mm. and I still need this row. Right. But once the sum of all the previous rows are greater than or equal to what I have ordered, that means all the previous rows, the job is done. I don't need this row, so I filter it away. And that okay. way, um, by uh, calculating all of the previous rows, I get a where clause that's pretty simple and stops whenever I have picked enough. And the nice thing here with the using the analytic function is that the order by then specifies I'm ordering by purchase date. Mm -hmm. So that rolling sum will take the oldest beers first, then the second oldest, and so on. And in right. that order, I will pick enough until I have enough to satisfy the ordered quantity and stop. Pretty neat, nice and straightforward. I think um, you, you talk about using first and first out, but there's a whole bunch of other algorithms you could pick, just like, you no. Know, by location, um, by quantity left in each location, and of course, exactly. you, you could do LIFO as well, and w whatever you fancy, really. And again, if you're doing this procedurally, a lot of people would then be like, oh, I've got to rewrite a bunch of code, huh? wouldn't they? But um, yeah, we can <laughs> change that. one line. Yeah. That so, order by can be changed. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I've, I've got a few examples here. I'll just flick backwards and forwards them pretty quickly and see if the people watching can see what's changing here. It's, we've just changed the order by, right? And yep. you've changed it from first in, first out to the shortest um, or the shortest route or the get rid of um, the smallest or the uh, That take. one's uh, take from the largest place. Yes. Yeah. These so picks. 
to the largest okay. places and we, or we could do the reverse, get the smallest places, you know. We've got yep. lots of locations totally. with like one or two um, bottles left, just go and clean those out. Or we could go to the place that's got a crate of 30 still left and start with that. So yep. and we can just flick back and forth these really easily. Sounds great, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, that's uh, having the having the analytic functions, the different pieces of the function, the partition, the order by the rows between having logic split up into pieces means that when you need to change one piece of the logic, you can just, in this case, change the order by, and that changes the uh, the lot piece of logic that determines your picking strategy, but you leave our, uh, the rest of the logic alone. Mm. Nice. All right. So let, let's let's stick with this clean out with the smallest quantities because it helps illustrate the next part of the problem you discussed, which is walk around the warehouse itself efficiently. Because if we do this, yep. um, we end up with an order about like this. We start at one, go up to double back on ourselves and keep doubling back on ourselves, which is it's not the fastest way to walk around this warehouse, really, is it? <laughs> not at all. So and we, uh, since time is money, we want to do it another way. Yeah. So we, we you know, if we're starting on A, rather than getting up to the top and walking all the way back down again, we just kind of want to hop over and go back down two and then up three and down four. So kind of like you follow a bit of a wavy zigzag rather than yeah. going up and down the same aisle all the time. So again, you, you know, as like I say, we can just do this all in the same SQL statement. So let's... We, we need to order these rows here at the top, basically, is what we need to do, don't we? Yes, because we cannot just use that it's aisle number one, two, three, four, physically in the warehouse. We need to number those he's going to visit, mm -hmm. and only those. Yep. Okay. So but, uh, okay. <laughs> yes, we can use the dense rank. Okay. So, because there's different ways we can number rows in with analytic functions, isn't there? So we've got dense rank, rank, and row number. Is like, so why why did you choose dense rank as opposed to either of the other two? Well, row number would give consecutive one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out there. So those two positions he is visiting in the same aisle would get different. Yeah, and I don't want that. Mm -hmm. So away with row number. Then we have rank. Yes, that's okay too, because I get the same values. Mm -hmm. But it works like Olympic Games. If there are two gold medals, then there's no silver medal, and we skip to bronze. So I would get one, then I would get three, then I would get seven. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, not what I want. What I want is that those aisles he visits will be getting numbered one, two, three, four. And that's exactly what dense rank does. Right. Because <laughs> when I have that, then I can use that case structure at the bottom there and uh, give me an ordering that goes up on the odd number of ales and down on the even number of ales. Yep. Yeah, okay. I think it, that's one of those things that kind of catches people out a bit. They think I need to do ascending and descending order on one column is, is essentially what you've asked for, really. And you, so people get all confused. It's like, right, order by ask and order by desk. And it, it just doesn't work, does it? But you've you got a nice little trick here instead. <laughs> yeah, I'm ordering ask all of it, actually. But since those that I want to order descending, I just order by the, the negative position. Mm -hmm. And since it's a numeric field in this case, it works. Yeah. Had it been some uh, alphanumeric, then would have been a little bit more tricky. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, negatives and alphanumeric, I'm, well, I'm sure there must be possible. It's not, not something we're used to dealing ah, with. Though. Something like uh, converting it to raw and doing uh, some bit, bit and or something mm -hmm. like that might, okay. might be possible. Yeah, still. <laughs> well, <But. laughs> this works, right? This, it's easy enough. 
just negate the ones that you want to go down. <laughs> and, exactly. So, and, and then we end up with a, a bit more of a sensible ordering system like this, don't we? Just like we want it. Yes. Yes. And again, this was something you could adapt a bit further to do, you know, you talk, have examples where you split it up by warehouse and stuff as well. So, you know. Yeah, but of... I had an example again that in this case, both warehouses, there's a door between them both at, on the top and at the bottom. Suppose there's only at the door at the bottom. So he can't go through up there where he's driving from warehouse one to warehouse two. Mm -hmm. Then I could just change the dense rank to partition by warehouse and order by aisle because that way I would get one, two, three in warehouse one and then I would get also one, two, three in warehouse two. Mm -hmm. So I would always start with an odd number. Yeah. So and, uh, it's example. again, mm -hmm. even though you want to change the logic by having it pieced out, it makes it very easy to change just that one little bit that's needed. Exactly. You just have that. Also, like you say, we were saying earlier, by having the partition by, it splits it up. Instead of a lot of people will try and approach this first by going, well, I've got these different warehouses. I need to loop through them or loop through the warehouses and stuff like that. Partitioning carves the data into uh, separate groups, solving that problem for us, doesn't it? Yep. Okay, so the, the, so this is quite a powerful technique actually. Calculate the rolling sum excluding the current row, um, and then we can say add up until we hit whatever total we want. Um, another e example that I wanted to share, something we discussed in last month's SQL Office Hours, is calculating SLA durations for support tickets. So you've, you've probably all experienced this, either a support engineer yourself or somebody submit, submit support tickets, you send it and the business says, you know, we'll respond to you in like two working days or something like that. Because for high priority tickets, they just work on them 24 by seven. So you can just add on the SLA hours to the time it was submitted. But for things in working hours, you can only actually count up working days for which for a lot of businesses is just Monday to Friday. So you need to essentially skip out the weekends. So again, by just calculating the total number of working hours we've accumulated, we can find when that goes over the SLA uh, limit and then we're done. So there's a lot of other, they, they don't, they're, they're not obvious. Oh, I need to calculate breach dates. I'm going to use an analytic function solution are they but you can still do them okay exactly so, yes all right then so we, we we got our fireworks we got our beer now we've all had a great time um and you know i'm i'm feeling we, we've all eaten and drank too much so we, we need to do a bit of exercise right so we need to get out there and go oh, running. <laughs> you go ahead and run and i'll drink some more beer all right okay uh, I'll, I'll stick with the running so um may not know this, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually a fairly keen runner um, and I like to try and keep running regularly. So what I want to do is see, well, am I running every day? What's the longest chain of consecutive days that I go running? So I want to look for consecutive rows. Um, so each time I go running, I'll log it in a table like this. And basically, I want to carve it up into these groups and for each group, see how many rows there are in it and um, the first and last dates as well, potentially. So how do we find consecutive rows? Pretty straightforward. Current value equals previous plus one. Um, and this is one of these things where a lot of people hear that and start scratching their head and coming up with all sorts of cracker solutions, don't they, Kim? Like, you know, hunting around. <laughs> yep. But, um, and I've seen, even with analytic functions, I've seen lots where it's, try to see, okay, uh, calculate some, some kind of value that shows difference between them. And then those places where that difference is greater than one, make it a null and then you can get <laughs> really complicated. Yeah. And you don't so, need it. Exactly. There's a nice little trick we can do here. Um, so if we assign a row number, a unique, consecutive row number to every single 
one um, and subtract that from the date. I'm, I'm assuming here the dates are unique. Um, trust me, it's, it's pretty certain that I'm only ever going to go running at most once a day. You know, I'm never going to go running twice a day. Um, <laughs> well, I was going to say, Chris, the better trick is yeah. to like not run every day. And who's chasing you? Why are you running so much? I'm, I'm just running away from my kids. You're running away out. from the <laughs> running away from the Ask Tom questions. <laughs> Need to get out. <laughs> yeah. So um, we can we can add this row number and subtract it from the date. And the really nice thing here is all the rows that we want to belong into the same group then have the same value. Um, so once you've got rows which an expression which maps to the same value, well, we can just group by that, can't we? Um, now, this is this is a technique which is probably easier to explain than it is to say the name of. So, so I, so I you say it, Kev, because I always, I always. Happy Bitsusan method. So uh, uh, I think it means something like Mr. Traveler. Mr. Traveler. So I guess it's Japanese or something like that. So. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, so the engine of it's pretty straightforward. We just take the date and use that row number function we discussed. So previously, Kim was saying had dense rank um, because we want ties to have the same value. Here, we want um, every row to have a unique value, unique consecutive value. So we've used row number, not rank or dense rank. Um, use that to calculate the group, group by it, and take the minimum uh, and count. So really cool technique this has been around for a well how we've had this analytic function since 8i something like that haven't we Kim? 8i yep yeah so but there, there, there's a new kid on the block a new way of doing it and that is a uh, row pattern matching so something i really love came in in 12c um and what we do here is we define pattern variables things we're looking for in the data and notice we've got consecutive well, that's definition pretty much matches our, you know, English definition of what um, consecutive values are. Is the current run date equal to the previous run date plus one? And then we've got pattern here, which is a, a regular expression on top of that. Now, you know, regular expressions can be a bit funky, can't they? <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> yes, until you have used them some, but again, Pattern matching can be extremely complex, mm -hmm. but for 95% or more of your use cases, you're pretty good with knowing that star means zero or more and plus means one or more. Exactly. And that covers a lot. <laughs> it does. So uh, one interesting thing here is we've got this pattern and it says init consecutive. So we know what consecutive is. It's listed in define, but I haven't said what init means, right? It's just like, what, what is this magical init thing? Um, so we can define, well, you can call these variables anything you want, and if we stick any of them in the pattern, then um, they are always true. And could, why, why would we do this? Well, let's think about the first row in our data set. We're saying current value equals previous value plus one. What, what's the previous value for the first row in the data set? <laughs> <laughs> it's null, isn't it? It doesn't exist. Exactly. Uh, um, so it's a, it's a little simplification method. So it's a bit confusing at first, but then we say, got this always true, match the first row, and then we can get zero or more instances of this. Um, and I believe you have a few other examples of how we can use this kind of technique to solve other types of problems in, um, that you discuss in your book, don't you? Yeah. Uh, same or very similar techniques. I have examples where uh, one is what they are, what's known as sessionization, meaning if you have, for example, a log of clicks on your website, mm -hmm. but you don't really have, so you don't have like a, a session state variable so that when they start, they log in. No, mm -hmm. they just click around. So what you want to kind of say is as long as clicks from the same IP address is within a few minutes from each other, it counts as the same session. Mm -hmm. 
but if he's been away more than an hour, then it counts as starting a new session. And that's a different uh, way there because here we are talking consecutive as being exactly one unit apart. Mm -hmm. With a sessionization, you are more fuzzy. You are saying they are, we define them as consecutive if there's uh, a small gap between them. Yeah. So less than five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it whatever is. Whatever you, you want to yeah. say, yeah. but uh, it's more uh, a fuzzy consecutive. Mm -hmm. Um, and that same then I could use on uh, like a server or batch job that logs, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive every five minutes. Yep. And because once you know this, finding groups of consecutive data, that actually also means you now know how to find gaps. Right. Yeah. And that's what you then want with a server or job keep alive. You want to find, whoops, there was a period here where it wasn't alive, where it wasn't sending any heartbeat data. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's the same, uh, exactly the same you can do uh, for finding gaps. Yep. Yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a subtle difference in what we do, how we've defined consecutive. And I think um, one of the things is, we only need to change this pattern variable and maybe the regular expression slightly um, to do that. Yes. So right. that's, uh, that's exactly the same thing as before that having this logic split up makes it quite easy to just edit one little piece and then you have a completely different logic. Mm, cool. All right, then let's move on. Where, let, do the last example very quickly. So we talked about, you know, pat matching is really cool, but I think this nice example shows how powerful it can be, not from a performance, uh, from a functional perspective, but from a performance perspective. So we've got uh, yeah. a classic tree structure here. And what we want to do is count how many nodes there are under all the total subordinates. So we've got 12 total things here. The thing at the top here is 11. Um, and the one leaves at the bottom, they've got no children. Each of those have one children beneath it. And we want to count all of those. Um, now, because the obvious question is, why would we want to do this? Um, <laughs> so the, there's a couple of reasons. What is company hierarchy? As soon as we stick people's names on there, you know, managers like to know how important they are. And how do you know how important you are? Well, it's how many people report and are underneath you. So you can count up those. Um, also, we've some you get some kind of like tree selectors on websites um, where you want to see okay, if I expand this, how many things are underneath it, and I collapse them. How many things does that collapse down to? There's a few situations where you might want to do this. Um, and the, the classic again, the naive way you'd use this is do do something like this, Kim. Right? So this is uh, yeah. Seems, Seems straightforward, right? <laughs> Connect by, it's been there for ages. Mm. Uh, the outer select query is just the employee hierarchy. You mm -hmm. have all seen this example millions of times. Yeah. Um, and then I put uh, in a little scalar subquery that does a new connect by to count all of the sub subordinates for each employee. Mm hmm. Okay. It works and it's it works. simple to understand. Yeah. Um, okay. So but that it, is a different way. It's a different way. There is a better way. Because the, the big problem with this, this sub query, it's, it's easy to think about and write, but actually we, we run that sub query once for every single person or every single row in the hierarchy, yeah. don't we? <laughs> and the same employees will be accessed and counted over and over again. Yep, yep. Okay, so there's, a, there's another way we, so pattern matching can give a different way. I think it's useful to actually visualize what's going on here. So we start at this circled node here, there are four children of it, and we're doing like a depth yep. search, we'll follow, follow these red arrows, 
and we know we can stop when we get to this node number three here because its level is less than the last or well, than the last thing we did. So if we've gone depth first, as long as the levels of these are lower or higher, I should say, they're a higher number, lower level. <laughs> Gonna make sure you get Deep it the right way. <laughs> Deeper. That, that's, that's the right way to say it, Kim. <laughs> um, as you get further down, they're children. As soon as you see a level which is the same or higher, then it's it's no longer a child, right? Exactly. Okay. So, um, and again, we 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 do this with pattern matching. It looks kind of similar to what we did before. Um, we're just saying. Instead of consecutive, we just say the level is greater than the start level. So this is our always true start. As long as that level's higher, keep adding it to the tree. Um, but there's this yep. e other extra clause we needed in here as well, this after match skip. The after match skip to next row. That's a cute little thing because that means that if we take uh, the employee example here, um, we start at king and everybody is deeper in the hierarchy than him. So we've actually started by going through all of the rows. Mm -hmm. So normally pattern matching would then say, okay, I'm done. <laughs> the skip to next row means that instead of continuing where we ended, we go back up and try again on the row before the first, uh, the row, just after the where we came, we started that. Yeah. So we can we essentially rerun the yeah. regular expression over the same row. This is many times. <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. No this worries. is an example that pattern matching. It's brilliant for that which the name says row pattern matching, and all of the typical examples of finding patterns in stock stock. Uh, prices. Yep. It's brilliant for that. But it can be, in one sense, perhaps a little bit misused, but it, it can be used as an engine to process your data in a much more um, declarative manner. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, like here, because we are not really discovering a pattern here. But we are using that pattern matching can do this to process our data in a very, very efficient manner. Yeah. So extremely you, efficient. Right, so you say extremely, you say you tested this by bulking up the EMP table with- um, I with made a, with, a big EMP table. Yeah. I made one employee at top called Larry. Right. <laughs> Under him on level two, there are 10,000 kings. Right. And each king has the usual 13 employees under him. So in total, 14,001 employees. Not a okay. huge table, but nope. medium-sized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I say, uh, should we see if anyone can guess how much quicker pattern matching was over um, connect by with the subquery before we, before we reveal the, the solution? So if anyone's awake on the chat, so we, we had our connect by original solution and our pattern matching solution. See if we can get some guesses of how much slower um, Connect by was. We, we, you know, we'll reveal that Connect by was slower because this is uh, it's it's. Well, I think it's quite astounding, given like you say, it's a, a fairly small table of fourteen thousand rows. So we've got a guess of five times, a uh, hundred, a uh, hundred times, uh, ten times. Oh, we're getting a bit close with ten times. <laughs> 20, uh, I still need to go up a little bit. Should we, should we reveal this, Kim? <laughs> yeah. Go on then. So, well, there we go. We are about 30 times slower for Connect By, um, and the, oh, these other metrics are just off the chart as well, aren't they? Exactly. It's not just the time. What's more important is actually the resources used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're doing significantly more work with uh, Connect By. I mean, you, there, there are bars on the metric, nice, I promise. They, they do actually exist. It's hard to see just because they're so small, but there, there really are some little bars there. Unfortunately, Connect By is just so much more costly in terms of resources and takes so much longer. 
it just it's almost invisible isn't it okay it is and any last comments you wanted to make on this then kim or i think that well basically the last comment on the match recognize is that it can be a swiss army knife tool mm -hmm. because you can declare some conditions and uh, then apply logic on the on that declarations uh, and uh, that way you can get some really really fancy things done very efficiently mm -hmm. it requires a quite different way of thinking than yep. usual sql um, <laughs> but it it pays off to learn it Oh, yeah, I agree. That's so, my key takeaway. Yep. So um, we had a question come in. Where can we get code for these examples? Well, here we go. You, Kim's gone into um, all the exam or most of the examples we've talked about in a lot more detail in these slides and resources. So screen yep. catcher now. Take your <laughs> and within those slides and articles, there will be links to where you can also download the SQL files belonging to them. Yep. Um, we also have the live SQL tutorial to correspond with this um, session. I'll be posting, I'll post the link for that as well, but that shows similar to what we've discussed today, that's got code, what breaks them down and shows you those. So check out the links for Kim's detailed description, live SQL tutorial, if you want to try them out. And I think that's just left to say, uh, thank you, Kim, for joining me. That was uh, really useful. And <laughs> I was happy to be here. <laughs> be a good idea. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, guys.